And I cannot think of a better person to kick off the health racism and communication series this semester. As you all know, he was appointed Dean of our school this past summer, but he will also be occupying one of the newly created presidential chairs, the Presidential Chair in Health Equity. This chair was created for exceptional scholars whose work transcends traditional academic discipline. So just a little bit of background on Dr. Levise. He was previously a professor and chair of health policy and management at George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. Prior to that, Dean Levise was faculty for 25 years at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. While at Johns Hopkins, he was the William C. and Nancy F. Richardson Professor of Health Policy and served as director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions. He received his doctorate in medical sociology from the University of Michigan and did a postdoctoral fellowship in public health at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. In 2013, he was elected to membership in the prestigious National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Levise has published more than 130 articles in scientific journals, all of which focus on social and behavioral factors that impact health outcomes. He has been a public leader on these issues through lectures and articles in major media. He was also executive producer of the documentary, The Skin You're In, which explores the disparities between black and white health in America. Please join me in welcoming Dean Lavise. Thank you. Um, I'm always uh, happy when people applaud before I do anything or say anything. <laughs> I hope I can live up to that, to the applause. So, some time ago, early in my career, I I came across an article that I read that was about race and health. And I don't remember, remember what the article was, so if the authors in the room just don't say anything about yourself, but it was an article. And it was something about the article that really upset me about the way they were using race to talk about this. And as a result, I wrote an, an essay uh, just one day. I mean, I probably wrote it for about two hours, uh, just angry. They wrote an essay about race, what does race mean in health services research? Turned out to be the most cited article that I've ever written. I was spent probably two, three hours on it. And then people started uh, to say, we should stop studying race. And then they would cite me as the authority for that statement, which is not at all what my essay said. So I wrote a second essay, because I figured, OK, people are not actually reading the essay. <laughs> They're reading the abstract or something. And so I wrote another essay, and I figured, okay, I will, I will make the title of this essay my point, my thesis, so they don't have to read it. And the title of that essay was, Why We Should Continue to Study Race, But Do a Better Job. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this issue of race and health, and the way we use race, and what it means, how we make progress towards uh, eliminating disparities by race and ethnicity. Um, I won't get into um, the research methods aspect of this too much today, but there will be future lectures where I'll talk more about that, the whole thing about the research methods that we use and how those methods are um, problematic for the study of race. But today it will be more uh, in discussion of con uh, the conceptual issues with the, the study of race that we all have to grapple with if we're going to make progress in addressing this issue of race disparities. Another thing I want to point out is this issue of communications. How you talk about race is really important. And it's very complicated and it's fraught. Um, I, was, I had a seminar that I used to do when I was at Johns Hopkins. Had a speaker come in who was speaking about racism and race. And a student in the audience raised his hand and asked a question about using the word racism, whether or not using the word racism is helpful for discussions about race and health, because the word racism can tend to cause people to shut down. And it was a really interesting question, right? 
And it made me think about, well, I'm going to another essay about that too. But it made me think about um, the experience that I had where I did a lecture where some of the things I'm going to talk about today was in that lecture. And I am certain, absolutely certain, that I never used the word racism in that lecture. Not, not because I didn't intentionally want to use it, but because it just didn't come up. And the lecture was about trying to make the case that race was not a biological thing, but yet often we still fall into this way of thinking that race is about biology. And after the lecture was over, a student came up to me after the class and said, good lecture, but I still believe that race is a biological thing. And that is because when you talk about race, often otherwise rational thinkers lose rationality because it is so politically wrong. So if we're going to have a conversation that's going to lead to progress, we have to be able to talk about these issues. And we have to be able to engage these issues intellectually. And we have to try to keep the emotions at bay and think this through. Why do disparities exist? And how do we eliminate them? That's the question. So this slide is the representation of racial disparities that I, I like to use. Now, this is for 2009. And the reason this is for 2009 is because Sometime around 2009, I just finally said, what's the point of continuing to update this slide? It's the same slide. Well, this is 2009, 1999, 89, 79, 1959. The pattern is the same. The absolute great changes, they've been decreasing for everyone, but the disparity has been consistent. Right? And what the disparity shows is that African Americans, in particular African American males, have the highest mortality rate of any group in the country, and that black women have the highest mortality rate for all females, and that men have a higher mortality rate than women. Which raises the question, why don't we have an office of men's health while we have an office of women's health? I'm not saying we don't need a women's health office, we need that. But whatever offices do, if there's an office that's gonna make a difference, it seems like the guys need an office, right? You know, but that's fine. So, most people became aware of this issue of racial disparities with the publication of one of two reports. In 1985, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services published a report called the Secretary's Report of the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health. Um, not a very creative title, but uh, I think with what they lost, what they uh, lost in creativity, they made up with the impact. It was actually the report that that alerted me to, to this issue and changed my career trajectory to address this problem. The other report would be 2002, Institute of Medicine's report on unequal treatment. So in all the years since we've been trying to address that, this issue and all of the investment that's come in trying to address race disparities in health, we've made very little progress in raising awareness. So this is a data from uh, two surveys that were conducted, one in 1999 uh, and 2010, showing that a shockingly small percentage of the U.S. population is even aware that racial disparities exist, and that there's been very little progress over this period of time. So often people, advocates, and people who do research in this area say, it's time to stop with the research, it's time to stop with the description, it's time to do something. And I am very much in agreement with that perspective. It's time for us to do something. But it is still time for us to build awareness because that's the first step in making change. We do have to continue to build awareness because so few Americans are even aware that we have this problem. So when we talk about disparities, I often find myself talking to uh, people that are not in the health profession. So I'm sure no one in this room subscribes to anyone who uses this, but that, that was a joke. But, um, <laughs> but when you talk to people at dinner parties and things, you know, they, 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 they finally get me to say what I do for a living. I start hearing these lay theories, and the lay theories usually come out to one of these three, these three things. 
either, well, there are these biological differences between race groups. And so how are you gonna fix that? That's something that's ordained by God, God gave the genes that we really gave to, and this is what we have. Or it's really a healthcare issue. We can just equalize access to healthcare, this would go away. Or, and the most interesting one of them all, it's not really race, it's really social class, it's really a poverty issue, which I find absolutely fascinating because even if that were true, which it is not, if that were true, what difference would that make? Is it any more acceptable that poor people live sicker and shorter lives than non poor people? It's still, to me, it's you're just changing, turning the same problem on its head. But I want to do what I want to do is go through each of these explanations, or as I call them, myths, and talk about you know, how these myths creep into our thinking in very subtle ways, and we find ourselves developing policy and invested in the myths rather than ferrying out what are your causes. And then I'm going to talk about conceptually what what race is and how this may help us as we go forward in trying to address some of these problems. So first, let me take on this first myth that this is a health care access issue. We can simply equalize access to care. I was having a conversation with a member of Congress. This is a, someone who recently uh, resigned his seat. I won't say the person's name, but he's a good guy. You know, I think well of him. Um, he did a lot uh, to, to try to do a lot of good for the country. He was. Um, um, I won't say the name, but I will say he he introduced a bill, a single payer health insurance bill in Congress every year for the last 30 years. He represented a district in South District, Michigan, and recently resigned from the House of Representatives. <laughs> so, uh, but I won't say his name <laughs> because I do genuinely like him. So he introduced the bill uh, yet again. This was a few years ago, and. Um, and so I asked him, I said, well, what would this bill do to eliminate racial disparity? And he looked at me as if I was absolutely crazy. He said, what do you mean? If we had a single payer system and all Americans had access to health care, then that would eliminate the disparity because everyone would have access to health care. And I was just, my, my brain short circuited. I wasn't able to get the response and say, I don't think that's the way it works. And then the conversation went in a different direction. But here's why that's not the case. So this is a chart from a study uh, uh, published by some guy named Luis uh, some years ago. Uh, and this is a study of uh, three hospitals in Baltimore. And I guess I owe it to my former employer to say Johns Hopkins is not one of the hospitals in this study. <laughs> Although I suspect the results would look exactly like this if it was one of the hospitals. And, and uh, so we went to these three hospitals. We abstracted 10,000 medical records to identify patients that were uh, candidates for coronary angiography, which is a basic procedure used to diagnose heart disease. And uh, once we identified those patients, we looked at what happened. Did they get a referral for the procedure? Now, 100% of the patients on this chart are insured. So we eliminated the uninsured patients. So everyone had insurance that would have paid for the procedure. Every one of these patients were actually in one of the three hospitals. So there, it wasn't that whatever access issues they had to overcome, they overcame those issues. They found their way into the hospital. They got seen, they got a diagnosis, they got a medical record, they had insurance and they were medically appropriate candidates for the procedure. 100% of these patients should have been referred, but what do we see here? We see that a little more than 82% of the white patients were referred. So we've got a quality problem, because that bar is not 100 either. But we also have a disparity problem, because fewer than 60% of the African Americans were referred. All three hospitals had a cath lab, by the way, so they all had to delay to provide service, and they all had the economic incentive to do it because they would have been reimbursed. Here's another study that I like to use uh, because it, 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 I think it drives the point home even more. This is from the VA hospital in Pittsburgh. 
They're looking here at revascularization, so these are patients who've already been diagnosed. They're all VA patients. They're all at the same VA hospital during the same time period, being seen by the same set of, uh, of uh, physicians. They all should have been referred for revascularization, but only about 50% of the white patients were referred, half, but half again of the African-American patients, about 25% of the of the black patients were referred. So we have a general quality problem, because the white rate is far lower than it should be, but we have a disparage problem. Now here are two examples of patient populations that had access to care, they were insured, they did show up at a hospital, they did seek care, and they even got a diagnosis. And we still find a disparity that is not the result of access to care to universal uh, access populations. The next one is that there's this biological thing. So there's some gene, right, that causes heart disease and cancer and diabetes and stroke and schizophrenia and HIV and homicide and, right? So obviously that's ridiculous, right? There's no gene that does that. But the way that this type of thinking creeps into our, uh, into our thought process is a lot more subtle than this. So, how many of you are familiar with this drug? By the way, raise your One. Okay. Just a hand. Okay. So I'm going to have to explain, tell the Bible story. For those of you that know the Bible story, please be patient with me while I tell the condensed version of the story. I'm going to have to leave out some details to get through it, but I'll speak as quickly as possible. And as a native New Yorker, I'm a native speed talker, so go with me on this. Okay. Bidil is a drug to treat uh, heart disease, and particularly congestive heart failure, which is a debilitating disease, about, uh, about half a million new cases per year, about five-year prognosis most diagnosed should diagnose. Very expensive condition because patients spend a lot of time in the emergency department. Ultimately, it's about five-year prognosis. It's a terrible condition you don't want to get. So in the 1970s, physicians started to discover uh, so it's, we started to develop new drugs to address heart disease. Drugs that are commonplace now. Calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, things like that. And some uh, physicians discovered that if you add these two very inexpensive generics to those, uh, those drugs, that they were having a very, very positive you know, impact, a very beneficial impact on patients. So they got the idea of, well, let's do a clinical trial and let's see if this new combination of therapy is really as good as we think it is. They do a clinical trial. The clinical trial showed that the therapy was wildly successful. They published an article in the Journal of Medicine, and this is great news, right? We've got this new, highly successful, effective therapy, and it's inexpensive because the two generic drugs are very cheap, right? And this is a perfect scenario. And this is a wonderful story if it ended there, but it didn't end there. They then said, well, what if we put these two generics together and got a combination pack on this? Then there would be an economic windfall that we would get, right? So they do that. And then they license that patent, and they're ready to come to market, except FDA says, no, you can't go to market. And the reason you can't go to market is because the trial that you did that you published in the New Journal did not meet all of FDA standards. So you need to do a new trial. Now, if you do a new trial, you know, as, you, as I'm sure many of you here have been involved in these studies, they take a long time to pull these studies together. By the time you did a new trial, the drug would be off patent and you would lose, and we lose the economic windfall. So what do you do? You've got this potential economic windfall, but you can't access it because you have to do you know, you have to do this trial and you don't have enough time to do it without losing the patent. <coughs> so they said, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll go back and do a little data mining of that original data set to see if we can find patterns in the data that help us to make a stronger case or help us to determine what to do next. So they do some data mining and they discover that this new combination therapy is more effective in black patients. Now, I said this intentionally. You heard that terminology before? Is this drug more effective in this group or that group? 
Okay, wait a second. If I call, what do you do? I call and you so, so, so you know what you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> you know, you know what? I know we're not in church, but you can get this. I haven't had much either. So let's try it again. So you've heard of these types of you've heard about this. This drug more effective and this that and blue for that. Yes, yes, yes. So what does that mean? Okay. This is what that meant in their case. Let's say that we had, now this is fictitious, right? I'm going to make this up. This is made up data. And so just to, 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 to illustrate it more. So let's say we had 200 patients, 100 white patients and 100 black patients. And we're going to keep it simple, black and white. Black patients and white patients. They have the same exact condition. Now before I go forward further with this thought experiment, I should say this is not a trick question. Although you're going to think it's a trick question because every audience thinks it's a trick question, but I'm telling you it isn't a trick question. It's a real question. So we've got these two groups of patients who have the same condition. Right? This is a fictitious condition, right? And okay, they were all diagnosed by the same person using assays from the same lab with the same lot number, and they were analyzed by the same at the same lab. Okay, so I'm not trying to trick you. Same condition. We then give the 200 patients, black and white patients, our pill. And these are the results that we get. 75% of the white patients, uh, I'm sorry, 75% of the black patients benefit, and 65% of the white patients benefit. You follow me? Okay. So that 10 percentage point difference, I can assure you, would be statistically significant. Under that perspective. All right? Yes. I love this audience. Have we now found a drug that's uh, more effective than black patients? Who says, yes, we have? Okay. Who says, no, we have? <laughs> Who's afraid to answer the question? <laughs> there you go. Right. It's not your question. Okay, the answer to the question is, no, we have not found a drug that's more effective in black patients. We have found a drug that's effective in a larger proportion of black patients. It was effective in more black patients, but it was not more effective in black patients. And because if you were part of that 65% of white patients that benefited, you benefited. If you were part of the 75% of black patients that benefited, you benefited. You didn't benefit more or less, you just benefited or you didn't benefit. So this was, and we certainly have not found this new black drug that's going to eliminate racial disparities. Which is, so this was the pattern that they found in their data when they went back and did their data. They found a pattern where a larger percentage of black patients benefited. And then they went back and they got a new patent, this time for the use of this drug by the with only black patients. Right? So in 2005, not 1905. 2005, we get the first drug ever approved for use in one race group. So what do you do next? Well, now we have time to do our clinical trial. So they do a new clinical trial. This time, they do a clinical trial only on self-identified black patients. And what do you think they found? I'll give you one guess. They found that by was effective. And why? Because bio is effective. Everything you know about these are If it had been an all Eskimo sample, it would have been effective. If it had been an all Hispanic sample, it would have been effective. It didn't matter what ethnic group it was, the drug is an effective drug. So they get the new patent and they come to market with this new drug for just black patients and with a wink and a nod, hoping that people will realize that right, it's not only for black patients. So my question is you're in your treatment room. Patient comes in who well, you think might benefit from bio, do you prescribe it? To whom do you prescribe bio? Do you prescribe bio to this African American gentleman? He has one grandparent from Ireland, one grandparent from Scotland, two grandparents from Jamaica, and he's born in the Bronx. So it's called a power. Do you prescribe bio to this African American? 
So he's got two Kenyan grandparents, and he's got two white American grandparents, and he's born in Hawaii, which is part of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm a boss. <laughs> Do we prescribe Bible to this African American gentleman? So now this guy's got one Chinese grandparent, and he's got a Thai grandparent who also has Chinese ancestry. He's got a white American grandparent who also has Native American ancestry. He's got a grand, uh, black uh, grandparent who also has Native American ancestry. From whom did he inherit his Bible receptor? <laughs> <laughs> and how do you know if the only data you have is his self-report of what his race is? And by the way, if you ask him his race, he will tell you that he is Caucasian, which is literally true in his case, right? So maybe it would be effective. This is Tiger Woods. And so finally, what about this guy? He looks like a just like a black dude to me. Do we prescribe by bill to him? Well, this is VJ Singh, who is from Fiji and is not an African American at all. Now, hopefully, VJ uh, will never need by bill, but my hope is that if he did need it, it would be available to him because what we know about the drug is that it's an effective drug. But we've now created this drug that is, is to be prescribed only to one ethnic group when all the science that we know tells us that it is not a race specific drug. This is what race is, a source of confusion when we don't apply the same logic, the same scientific thinking that we use in virtually everything else that we do in science. So, oh, then there's the final myth that it's not really race, it's really social economics, that's social class, which I, I just, I'm just bewildered by this one. But this was the easiest one to dispel. This is a uh, some charts from the Health Unity Survey <coughs> looking at uh, race differences in a variety of outcomes. And it doesn't really matter that much what the health outcome is. There is a race disparity at all levels of education. So uh, I like to tell my affluent African American friends is that you're not going to educate or income your way out of this problem. There is still a race disparity even at the highest level of income and education. Couple of charts showing income. This is from the medical expenditure panel survey. And again, it doesn't matter very much what the condition is. This is the most interesting chart here. This is the only case that I know of where uh, disease risk actually increases with income. And this is for hypertension in African Americans. Your risk of hypertension actually increases as you go to higher income levels. And uh, I'll, I'll say more about that later if anyone cares to hear my uh, hypothesis about this one. This is from a paper that we, but I'm not yet uh, written out, but we'll be publishing soon. Okay. At the core of the question of, of this is what is race? What is it? It used to be, even in the research that we did, that we didn't. Uh, we would train interviewers not to ask people their race. If you're, if you're old enough to remember that, it certainly evolved from the 1990s. We train interviewers, don't ask their race or gender if it was thought to be insulting to, to the, the person who was enrolled in the study. So how do you measure race? You look at a person and you make an assessment of who you think they are and then you check a box on the form. And that is what the race variable was in most of the studies. Now I think the protocol typically is to tell people to ask every single question about how obvious it can be. I had a friend who did a study, uh, what's a really informal study that, I mean, it was, this is how informal it was. He called around to obstetrics students with the new people and said, how do you guys collect race in your unit? And he got as many different answers for as many different hospitals that he called. You know, one hospital, well, we give the form to your parents, and whatever they do, they do. Another place was, well, we look at the mother and based on how she appears, check the box. Other hospitals said, well, we look at the medical records. Whatever the mother's medical records said, this is all over the place. This is the variable that we consider a democratic, democratic, uh, demographic variable on par with income and education and uh, sex and other indicators that we 
think of them as solid variables, but in fact, what they really are are the billions of political variables determined by political considerations. The origins of this concept go back to the 1600s when um, naturalists and explorers began traveling the world, <clears throat> identifying humans and other parts of the planet that look differently. And just as they were classifying animals and creating classification systems for animals, they applied the same logic to humans and decided that skin color was a sufficiently important differentiation between one population and the next that we would create different groups and created these five groups. Um, Caucasian or white, Mongolian or yellow, Malayan or brown, Negro or black, and American or red. 1600s. The United States doesn't have an official um, definition of race until publication of Directive 15 in 1977. And if you look at Directive 15, it is the same five categories that evolved out of the 1600s. Still the same category we need today. There's been an update to Directive 15, but it's the same pattern, basically. Looking back at the set of the um, at the census. Now, I should point out that I know that I'm breaking every rule of PowerPoint slide making here. <laughs> to make a point, I'm going to show you in the next three slides the way that race was measured in every census ever taken in the United States, beginning in 1790. And, um, and you see that rarely do we even measure it the same way in two consecutive censuses. So, 1790, three white males, three white. Uh, Females and all other free person and slaves. 1800, we add um, Indians not taxed. Um, 1930s, we include, oh no, I'm sorry, 1820, then, uh, I'm sorry, 1820, we include three colored persons in a separate category. 1850, we add mulatto, so people that are mixed race. 1860, Indians get added. And in 1880, they had Chinese, so now we have nationalities being added here. Right? We're concluding nationality with race. 1890, they decided mulatto was not enough, so we had to add quadrones and octones. And another nationality here, Japanese. Moving into the 20th century, um, we start getting um, religious groups added in 1920, where we add Hindu. So now we've got race, nationality, and um, Hindu. 1930, black becomes Negro. Mexicans get added. Koreans get added. Moving to the 19, uh, second half of the, 19, of the um, 20th century, 1970, Negro becomes black. Notice how many lines now I need to use to get all the categories in. Do three lines by now. The point is, the way race is measured, the way it's designated, the way it's identified, is a political decision. A set of decisions are made through a political process. I was um, on a 19, I think it was a 19, or 2000 census. I was on the Secretary's task force on uh, data where we uh, advised the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services on data, data issues. And uh, people would come in on link for a new box for the group. And we were the, the group that, would, that held the hearings and would advise the Secretary. Everyone wanted their own box, not realizing that the problem is the box. The problem is the box because the box designates the categories. And what we're trying to do designating race in this way, is we're taking human variation, which is continuous, not categorical, and we're trying to place people into these categories. So there are many people that fit comfortably into the categories, but there are many people that don't fit comfortably into the categories as well, because human variation is continuous. Now, whatever race means, it means, it means something, it means something profound when you look at the racial disparities that we document clearly and consistently across all disease categories, right? But what it means is something that is more in the social realm than in the biological realm. So, 
So that the disparities are not caused by genetic healthcare access or socioeconomic status, then what is it? And I argue that what it is is the fact that we live in the country together, but we experience the country in very different ways. Because of structural racism, because of segregation, which facilitates differential exposure to health risk and differential access to resources that are protective of health. And if you just think of different communities, even here in this city, that are predominantly of one racial group versus another, and the differences in the infrastructure and the resources in those communities, and that is what tracks with race. That is what correlated with race. That is the spurious correlation. Race is measuring exposure to differential types of communities and community resources. And especially when we rely on national data, it becomes problematic. So the country is a vast country that spans 11 time zones, if you include Hawaii, which is part of the United States. It's really <laughs> 11 time zones. That much geographic breadth, right? And it would be like if, if you turn on um, uh, Good Morning America to get the weather, and you said today the average national temperature will be 42 degrees. That is a calculable number. You can calculate that number, but how helpful is it? We don't take into consideration that we're not uh, living in the same community, we're not living with the same exposures, we have more access to the same resources. And we see race differences, we assume that the race differences are about something endemic to the race groups, rather than that the race differences are about different lifestyles, different communities, different exposures that people are experiencing. So this map was created at the University of Virginia based on the 2010 census. They placed a dot representing every American in the country, over 300 million dots. Also taking them a long time to place these dots. And they're color coded. So the blue dots represent whites, the white people, the green dots represent black people, Asian represented by the red or orange dots, Hispanics are a yellow, uh, yellow dot. So let me just let me zoom in on a city. You might recognize this city. City of New Orleans. When you look at how the dots are displayed across the city, you see that this city, like other cities in this country, is massively racially segregated. There are clear places where the blue dots end and the green dots begin. There are and this is every, I've done this for virtually every city in this country. The pattern is the same, so don't feel bad. New Orleans is no worse than the other city. But it's just as bad as the rest of the country in terms of the segregation. So when you think about it, and those of you who know the city, think about the neighborhoods that are represented here. What are the amenities? What are the resources in those neighborhoods that are dominated in blue versus the ones that are dominated in green? This is a source of variation that we never or rarely account for in the research that we do. Rarely. So can we simply take a person living in Center City and another person living in Carrollton and assume that we can control for everything and make comparisons between these two people when we don't measure this, the fact that they're living in different neighborhoods, different communities, different environments, with different exposures, and different levels of access to protective factors. So there's been a, a literature, um, a growing literature on the relationship between segregation and a variety of health outcomes documenting that communities that are racially segregated, in those communities you find white and Communities that are segregated in, uh, and black in this country, we tend to find worse health outcomes. But when black and white people are living together in the same environment, you find that the health outcomes are more similar because we have the same exposure, a similar lifestyle, and similar outcomes. I would argue that much of the disparity, not all of it, but much of the racial disparity that we see in the research that we do is the result of racial segregation, which results from structural racism, which results from 
policies that we've had in this country over generations that produced racially segregated cities, such as New Orleans. A couple of those studies. This is a Washington, D.C., which is a really interesting way of depicting it. This, is a, this was done by the Robert Johnson Foundation, where they took the D.C. metro. If anyone knows D.C., you know it's not a very big city. It's, to my thinking, as a New Yorker, it's a tiny city. Um, and, uh, but if, you, if you're at that, at the, in the center of the city there, which is uh, Metro Center, depending upon which line you get on to go home, and which neighborhood you're going into, life expectancy can vary dramatically within this very small geographic area. So in uh, Northern Virginia, 80 years old, in Montgomery County, Maryland, 81, Prince George's County, which is predominantly African-American, nearly 75 years old. Depending upon which train you get on to go home, we can predict life expectancy. They've done these maps in many other cities as well. So, the point, defining race is complicated, very complicated. We usually do it with a simplistic binary variable. We don't account for the fact that there's dramatic variations that are captured in that variable. So, a lot of the models, a lot of the studies that we do are likely to be misspecified because of that. Now, before I depress you, I should say, so you go into PubMed, you put my name in, and you will find that I've committed some of the same sins that I'm talking about here today. So it's okay. But the point is to go forward and sin no more. Not, <laughs> okay, that's the point. You repent and sin no more. Not, sorry. Um, race differences in health are not simply a matter of access to health care. There is no scientific evidence of biological differences between race groups. Now, I would say that there could be scientific evidence based on epigenetic differences. Those well, epigenetic differences are not endemic to the race groups, but they are correlated with the race groups because they are measuring the genetic expression of the exponents that they have. So it is possible that you will find higher prevalence of some genetic characteristics in one race group versus the other. And my argument is that it's likely that it's an epigenetic phenomenon, not something that is not some black gene that produces all of these diseases that you see, these disparities happen. Race differences are not are, are found among affluent people. So thinking that because you have a certain amount of educational income and you're going to be, you're going to be saved from race disparities is a mistake. And race, it seems to me, is caused by, primarily caused by exposures that occur because of structural racism. So now, the issue of communicating <coughs> about, this, about this topic, about race disparities, is something that I, I think a lot about. How to communicate these things to people in ways that people will get it. And what I find is that usually when I talk about these issues, one reaction is confirmation. There was some segment of this audience like this who simply said, yes, it's all makes sense to me, I get it. But that's not the only reaction. There's also what I call the tuna. That occurs when you use words like racism and things like that. People kind of drop, they turn it off, and they don't want to engage the topic. Again, I tried to tee that up to you to you if you did it, so that you would be thinking about that, so that hopefully those of you who may have a proclivity to tune that out would not be so uh, willing to do that and might be willing to listen and engage it. Intellectually, not emotionally. Um, but I don't know. Then there's also the backfire effect. The backfire effect is very problematic. And uh, the backfire effect, I think, happens often to racial and minorities when they see this. When they look at it and say, here we go, yet again, we are the disadvantaged group. And that leads people to not take action. I implore you not to let the backfire effect impact you. Because what we need is a somewhat emotional response. But that emotional response needs to be an activated emotion, not depression. It needs to be passion. It needs to be uh, outrage. It needs to be um, something that activates you to action, to make a difference, to try to impact this problem. So there are 
We're here today to talk about race disparities in health. But there are, in fact, I say, four great disparities that cause each other and are caused by each other. And until we engage all four of these disparities together, we're not going to address the health disparities problem. So today we're meeting to talk about health. There's another group somewhere else in this city probably talking about the other three. But we need to be talking to each other. We need to go be talking across sectors to make a difference. And these other disparities are, of course, well, health disparities, but also wealth, education, and criminal justice. And by criminal justice, I'm talking about aggressive policing and mass incarceration. Each of these are caused by each other, and each of these cause each other. So we know that education is one of the best known predictors of health, and we also know that children that have health problems are less likely to be able to develop educational, be able to succeed in school. We know that people in prison have very high rates of illiteracy, and people want, often wind up in prison because of frustration resulting from undiagnosed and untreated learning disabilities that we don't, um, we don't diagnose in the public schools. We know that people are able to avoid prison because they have the wealth to afford high quality legal services and that there are many people in prison is because they don't have the ability to afford that. And the best way I can think of to ensure that a group of people will not develop wealth is to be in prison between the ages of 17 and 34, which is when most people develop the human capital necessary to create wealth. The health and wealth relationship is probably the best known correlation we have in health research. And we know that people wind up in prison because of undiagnosed and untreated mental health conditions. And that people come out of prison sometimes sicker than they were when they went in. Now, none of that should be a surprise to anyone in this room. None of this is news. But it's not the way that we think about the work that we do. There is no important problem that can be resolved by any one discipline. No important problem. They all require multidisciplinary approaches. So in closing, let me ask you this, this last question as I close. How many of you here are aware that there are more black men in prison than in college? OK. How many of you actually looked that up to see if that was true? It's been I even heard uh, President Obama make that statement once, which stunned me, because I did look it up to see if this was true. So let me share, as a researcher, and a lot of you are researchers too, so shame on you. I'm going to uh, start you what I found when I went to the U.S. Department of Education and U.S. Department of Justice data from home today to see if this is in fact the case. This is just. I grew up in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Brooklyn. I know a lot of people that went to prison, but that just didn't track with my own personal experience that there would be more black men in prison than in college. It didn't make sense to me. So I looked it up. So in 2006, which is when I first did this, that year there were 36,800 black men in um, prison. Now that is an unacceptably high number. So please don't interpret anything I say to suggest that I think that that's acceptable. That is not acceptable. But that year, there were 896,000 black men in college. So it wasn't true that year. Now, <laughs> now, OK. The prison population, adult population, can be any age, right? any you know, up to 100 years old. The college age population is typically going to be between 18 to 22, 23, something like that. So the best we could do of lining up the age categories from these two databases was the age range of 20 to 29. So in that year, 310 black men in prison, 480,000 black men in college, still more black men in college. So then I said, OK, was there ever a year where that statement was true? So I went back as far as I could with data from these two data sources. And this is what I found, that there were two years where the numbers were close. But even then, there were more black men in college than prison. So not only is that statement not true, it never was true. It was a lie the first time it was said. It is still a lie now. And if you get nothing else out of this lecture, I ask you to join me in my one-man crusade <laughs> to 
to stop this horrible lie and myth from being spread. Because if you believe this, though, how did that impact you when a black male shows up in the hospital for care? Do you engage him in the same way? Do you get the same level of trust? How is his health care impacted by that in subtle ways, potentially? Subtle ways, potentially. Right? What is it about black men that that lie can be believed? Think about that for a moment. If I said there are more Asian men in prison than in college, you would look at me as if I was insane. Right? You would never believe it. You would never repeat that statement. But yet, this statement is being repeated. So that's my final plea. Join me in my crusade. Please dispel this. Please pass the word. It's a lie. It's not true. It never was true. It was a lie the first time it was said, and it's still a lie now. And I thank you for your attention. Now we've got to get more in this college. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, one thing I want to ask you about is the um, numbers of black men in medical schools. Yeah. Um, I mean, my own personal experience as a faculty member is that the numbers have gone down. Um, at LSU right now, we have one African American male student in our class. Yeah. In class. And um, from what I've read, it's just Unfortunately, it seems to be a nationwide trend. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's a, it is. So um, the, the numbers really have not changed. I, I'm not. I don't. I haven't seen the numbers for this time yet, so I can't speak to this year. But up until last year, the numbers have consistently been between four and five percent since the 1960s. That is national, you know, um, and it, it is a. It's a. It's been a tough problem to address. You know, there's a number of attempts to, to deal with that. I was on a commission once, uh, Lewis, uh, Dr. Lewis Sullivan headed up to, to deal with this. And we, we haven't been able to address, uh, to, to solve the problem. Um, part of it is a pipeline issue. I mean, by the time you're ready to apply, successfully apply to medical school, you have to pass through um, many levels of education. You know, people get weeded out along the way for a variety of reasons, some of them not, not necessarily fair or equitable reasons, some of them uh, because of you know, in, inadequate um, um, uh, K-12 education in many of the cities. The African Americans are still disproportionately in urban, in urban uh, settings attending public schools, which is a national problem that the schools are less likely to, uh, to have sufficiently strong science education to prepare people for medical school. So this is a, uh, a problem, not just in medicine, quite frankly, I think it's a, it's a problem in many fields. Um, and those cases where you do see a large number of African Americans that tend to not be in the, um, in the sciences or the uh, quantitative areas as well, and of course it's the same problem. So, so what, what I'd like, well, since, I'm, since I've got the, the microphone here, uh, I am the dean, so here's my chance to say something about what, what I'd like to work with. You know, I'd like to see us as a school work with. Here in Louisiana, we have four sort of black colleges, and one of them has two campuses, so you can take some of them. We have two different schools, so you simply have five different campuses. I've already reached out to some of the presidents of, at those schools to connect with them with the idea of establishing a, um, a public health academy 
where we would start training students from those, those colleges as well as undergraduates here at Tulane and to prepare them to be able to apply directly into PhD programs coming right out of the undergraduate uh, degree in public health. Hopefully, a portion of those students would be coming to Tulane, but I'd love to see them go off to all of the leading schools of public health and, uh, and grow the pipeline. You know, you, you asked the question about medicine, but if you look at the, the, the public health, medicine, and nursing, you said nursing is doing far worse than medicine. Nursing is by far the worst in terms of its diversity, which is shocking because you would think that it would probably be <laughs> Public health and, and medicine generally do better than, than uh, nursing does, but all three fields are uh, woefully inadequate in, in the diversity of, uh, of the field and certainly the diversity of their faculty. Hi, my name is Katie. Um, first, I just want to say thank you, Emily, for um, your presentation. Um, I just was interested when you mentioned the part about you know people of different races kind of seeing the world in a different lens and um i'm just wondering I and mean, obviously this is a, a multi-sectoral issue um but do you have any advice on just like the day-to-day -day things that we could be doing in our lives to try to try to equal equalize this lens that people are seeing the world through i have a four-year-old niece who is biracial and at Four years old, she looked at me and said, I wish my skin was the same color as yours, Auntie Katie. And that broke my heart. How does that happen at four years old? Um, so I'm just wondering what we can do like on the day to day, you know, conversations or interactions, or if you have any advice on how to. Well, I think it is those very late interactions. If you're talking about just the lens issue, so the, the issue that I was talking about really wasn't so much individuals' world view or perspective, but rather their actual physical exposure to health risk and their availability of resources in different communities. So if you're in certain communities, the quality of the food that you have access to is different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the levels of um, uh, exposure to health risks, such as, I don't know, lead paint, for example, diesel fuel, major roads running through your neighborhood, things like that, you know, certain allergens, particulates. Maybe not in this city, because this city is so old, but anyways, <laughs> that whole house. <laughs> but you know, but uh, nationally, you look at that. So I'm thinking more from an environmental justice standpoint, uh, those environmental exposures and other resources you need. So, for example, quality of healthcare. You know? There's a study that I did, maybe if I do some invite a presentation, I'll talk about some of the data that we collected um, around this thing, where we studied a community in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, uh, Baltimore, that is racially integrated. And you were able to find no racist barriers in that community because everyone in that community was sick because the community is a, is a community that's going to produce bad health outcomes. And no one is going to be protected in protected a community like that with no access. There's no supermarket, there's no bank, there's no you know fast food. Mm -hmm. The only food that's there is mom and pop's fish fries, things like that. And in a food environment like that, in a housing environment like that, it's going to be bad health outcomes. So that's that's one thing. That's these exposures. Now the lens issue you're talking about is really more, I think, from a, from, a, from, a, from a psychological standpoint and a cultural standpoint. I think the only way that we deal with that is by people interacting with each other, people getting to know each other, people finding commonality. That's hard to do if people are living in segregated environments where they're not interacting with each other. And I think that's the case in much of the country. So here in an environment like this, in a school where people come together in the same room and in the same building, you know, reaching out to people of other race on ethnic groups, building those relationships, you'll find that people are more, certainly my experience has been that people are more common, more alike than they are different. And the differences like skin color tend to, when you get past the superficial, when you actually get to know a person, I think there really aren't often that many differences. People you'll find across the political spectrum, regardless of uh, their skin color, you can find people who have all different points of view. So engage with people, and that's, that would be my advice. Hello. Hey. Um, 
I'm curious how you envision data collection for large groups that would both give us an accurate picture of how people's lives are affected by their melanin and also with like resist pigeonholing um, that people are collecting data about. So I was sort of think maybe I should have worked with data on the study and talked about it domestic. I was told it would be like a community audience, but not, not mostly researchers. So I think it's one of those <laughs> science things, so it won't be central. But uh, one of the solutions that we came up with was to find these basically integrated communities to see what happens, right? So so what we do typically is we take a national data set and then we try to use uh, statistics to adjust for differences between populations to create equal groups. That's what most that's what most of our modeling is trying to do. Right? We try to adjust, we try to create equivalent populations that allow you to make comparisons. Now, this is inadequate because there's so much unmeasured variation. And if you don't know everything to measure, which of course we can't possibly know, your model is going to be misspecified. For the non-research from sorry if you're using technical terminology, but I don't know how to talk about this stuff. So your model's going to be misspecified because you're going to have unmeasured uh, error. Our idea was, okay, what if we, instead of trying to deal with this problem through statistical analysis, what if we could deal with it with study design? So we can design the study in such a way that we can uh, parse out the noise by looking at people who live in the same social environment so that the social determinants become a constant rather than a variable that we have to measure. You see what I mean? And that's what, that's what we did with that study. So that's one strategy. The other strategy, if you have, you know, you're going to look at a big geographic area or multiple areas, is that there are multiple ways to measure race. So one way is to ask the respondents what race they say they are. Another is for the, and we've done this in some studies too, let the, the interviewer identify what race they think the person is. CDC in, um, actually did, a, a, did a, uh, an experiment using PRFSS for several years they did this, where they asked people um, what, rate, what their race was, the normal question that they do, that they use. <clears throat> then they also said, well, what, what race do people sometimes fall off of thinking of? And you had a variation there. And what they were able to show is that what race people think you are is a stronger predictor of health than the race that the person said they was, which is an interesting finding. Um, I can give you the records if you want, but I don't know if that's on my head. Um, Kamara Jones was the author of several of those papers. So if you look at them, CJ, CJ Jones will find his name. The CDC. Um, you can also, there was a, a couple of studies I've seen where they actually use light meters to measure skin color how dark the skin is. So if you triangulate something like that, you use, a, use a, a light meter to measure skin color. You ask the person your race, you ask them what group people can think that they are, and you let the interviewer ask, and you have these different measures of, of uh, race. You know, maybe that would help. You have to also consider ethnicity. So within race groups, there's, there's uh, differences in nationality, for example. So, White, what are white Americans? White Americans are people who have ancestry from the entire geographic expanse of Europe, right? But uh, a scientist in Sweden that want to do a clinical trial would probably only use Swedish people in their trial. Someone in Greece would probably only use Greeks if they were doing that study, right? But the descendants of people from all of these groups is what white Americans are. We will never account for that source of variation which is like, which likely exists. We also know historically different European groups have had different levels of discrimination when they came to this country. And they've had different trajectories and histories in this country. But this is another source of variation that we don't account for, right? That's just among whites. Black Americans also, very African Americans, those who have ancestry to the middle passage come from a huge geographic uh, uh, expanse of Western and Central Africa. Then you've got more recent immigrants from, Af from Africa who have now come into the country, and you've got people from the Caribbean. So each of these groups have different trajectories. That's a source of variation that we don't account for. So my proposal would be account for that, measure that variation. And then Hispanics is probably more problematic in our minds. What is that? It's people, 
that come from countries that were once colonized by Spain. That's the best I can do. Plus Brazil, right? That's, that's the best I can do. So that, well, how about we pass that out and not assume that Mexicans are similar to Cubans? But you think, just think of US immigration policy. If you are from Cuba and you can get in a raft and get far enough from the island, the US Coast Guard will come get you and bring you into the country. If you're from Puerto Rico and you come here, you're already a citizen. If you're from Mexico or Central America, we're trying to build walls to keep you from coming into the country. So all of those groups we call Hispanic, but they're very different groups. And so I would say future research needs to take into consideration resources and variation that we ignore with this very crude five category variable that, that OAB calls race. Good. I will promise to answer this question quick more, more quickly than <laughs> my previous answers. Good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, Naomi Osaka appeared to go from Asian and Japanese to just full Japanese in one tennis tournament. So, you know, it happens. Uh, so, my question to you, though, has to do with mental health and access to it and how certain communities view it as a real thing versus, you know, you as a woman or a man, and that would have solved the mental health issues. And and so, so real quickly, a story that a friend of mine who went to law school at Florida says is that uh, many of the students of his peers took like cocaine and other things, uh, drugs for ADHD, to make them uh, attend and class better and study longer. Whereas where he's from and, and me as well, we would never even have thought of that being like an option to do in one of these schools. So I was wondering like how people, how communities can view those things as a help more than not necessarily cocaine, but other drugs as a as more of a help to them and in their outcomes versus you know seeing it as a tactic. Well I'll answer that question this way. I, mean, I think what you're getting at is the hope that there is so I've mostly talked about the this biological concept of race and I've talked about the structural issues. Policy. But there's also this, there's also a cultural dimension to it, where at some point we're all told what group we belong to, even by our parents. And this is our group, and this is the culture of our group. This is what we eat, this is how we this is how we celebrate, this is what we do. These are the, the rules of our culture, right? We're all taught that. So there is cultural variation that also is correlated with race. Now race is not culture, of course, but cultural variation is clear. I think that's what you're pointing out, that you, you see these differences that they try to raise. But I, I think in the cultural dynamics more so than um, uh, race, but they do have implications for uh, for racial disparities between people with, with, with behavior different behaviors. So there's a paper we did on that um, called a Black Hispanics, Black or Hispanic, where we looked at Black Hispanics and compared them to is non-black Hispanics and compare them to blacks that are not Hispanic and father. They actually are a third group, a separate group, that really needs individual attention from a health education standpoint. So um, I think if we did more analysis like that, we would find that there are more and more of these uh, smaller groups if you take a more intersectional approach and, and start crossing that out. So it's probably the case that uh, you know black students in that same law school who maybe grew up in, in a more white environment with more white friends, they might be more likely to use those drugs also because their cultural reality is a little bit different and they grew up in a different environment. And so I would, I would propose it, but not something like that is probably more of a function of where you grew up, how you grew up, and what you see as, as an acceptable as a function of, of what your background is. Oh, Good afternoon. Um, I just have a really quick question. Considering all the variables that um, compounded that you say go into 
health disparities be erased, um, whether it be quality of health care, access to health care, education, those things. If we take an example like Washington, D.C., um, where people feel like they're losing their culture through the, like gentrification, would you say that gentrification has had a, a positive impact on the quality of health care? Gentrification, a positive impact on the quality of health care. Extremely complicated question. <laughs> Gentrification is an extremely complicated problem. I don't see that gentrification has had an impact on health care. It has an impact on displacing people and moving them around into different places, which may influence their access and their ability to access health care and other resources that they're accustomed to. You know, uh, uh, impacting relationships, friendships, their social networks uh, impacted by it. You know, what I've seen in, in Baltimore, where I uh, was living up until a few months ago, when they did regentrification in certain neighborhoods, what happened is that the health statistics dramatically improved. Why? Because the people got healthier? No, because the people got moved out and new people moved in that were healthier and more affluent. and and new resources and new amenities moved into those neighborhoods. And so, yeah, this is just better for that census tract, but it's because they just swapped out the people, put in new people. I think that's what gentrification does. It, it just displaces people and moves them to different places and spreads the, spreads the, um, so there was a, uh, when they imploded the projects, the, the high rise housing projects in Baltimore, I was talking to uh, some people in the health department there who showed me this map they had. There was this one housing development that was so massive, it was its own census tract. Huge, huge, huge uh, this place. Um, they showed me the uh, uh, STD, STD, uh, STI rates, right? And it was very high in that census tract. They imploded the, 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 um, the, 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 the develop, housing development and then you saw the cases just spread throughout the city. So now the rates of SDIs spread throughout the city, and the rates in that census tract plummeted, of course. <clears throat> That's what gentrification is to me. It's, it's moving people around. It's moving people with, and people take their problems with them. So the problems move into other communities, and, that's, and that is a big part of the challenge because then people don't want people from those neighborhoods moving into their neighborhoods because they say they're taking their problems with them. So it's, a, it's, it's an impossibly uh, complicated problem, um, I think. There's another hand over there. <clears throat> Do you see um, that the Affordable Care Act had any impact on healthcare care disparities I think it's definitely had a positive impact, not as much as it could have, but the Affordable Care Act has had a positive impact. It certainly has dramatically reduced the, the number of uninsured people in this country, and I think that's a good thing by any standard. That's a good thing. So I would, I would answer it that way. I would also say that there are 68 health equity provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Very few of those provisions were funded. So they were never implemented. So the potential was much greater in terms of what that what that law could have done. But to answer the question, yeah, I, I think it's been I think it's definitely been positive. Just the, the very fact that just just eliminating discrimination uh, in the you know guaranteed issue, eliminating discrimination among people who have pre existing conditions, that alone I think is a is a you know a huge improvement for everybody. And um, so I think that's to me an easy, very easy. Yes, it has helped. Has it solved the problem? It hasn't made the problem go away. It hasn't brought health equity, but it certainly has moved the needle in the right direction. I think. Okay, I think we are done here. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>